in the name of the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. I am that I am. I bow before the universal light of God. I bow before the light within these souls who are becoming day by day more of thee, O Lord God Almighty. As thou hast manifest thy miracle presence in the hearts of the saints, so God our Father, we pray to thee in this hour, let personal and planetary crisis recede before the great central sun of being that I am. Let that central sun, as thy heart a flaming fire within us, roll back the darkness of death and degeneration. Roll it back. Roll it back. Roll it back. Let light spring forth within these hearts as a garden of light, a fountain of living flame. Let this flame which we bear, O oh God, secure life where I am. Where the I am is manifest in thy heart, in these temples. And let that burning and shining light which we have witnessed in John the Baptist and Jesus Christ and the procession of saints from thy heart, now appear in full glory because thou hast ordained it and called us to this purpose. We give thee our life and our temple, Spirit most holy, Father and Son, Blessed Mother, Come into our temple and live, that all life might live to praise thy name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Won't you be seated? When we pursue any earthly endeavor or discipline, we go to someone who is an expert. I'm sure you've all had that experience in college or in life. Something you wanted to know, and you wanted to know the real, living, tested, tried, and true method or discipline. You've sought out the experts, and you've found the answers. When you want the ascension with all of your heart, not as an escape hatch from the unpleasantness of your karma, but because it is the supreme offering of the self that all life might live. You go to those who have made it. You go to the ascended masters because they are intimately acquainted with the process. They understand the path. They know its blessings. They know what is absolutely necessary. They know the pitfalls of the human ego. They know the compartments of consciousness. They know all about psychology and the meager, meager offering of that study which we have today in its discipline in our universities. They know all about the teachings of religion which Serapis Bay says, though there be errors in religion today, these errors are covered over by the very sincerity and heart flame of the people. And so covered over with holiness and devotion and people who truly, in spite of the doctrine, the false doctrine that binds them, do contact the living word. We find that nevertheless, what we have given to us in our religion or in our studies of psychology or life or philosophy entirely misses the path of the ascension. I searched high and low all over the world with every teacher I could find, asking if anyone knew of the path of the ascension. No one knew the most dedicated Christians had very nebulous ideas about the ascension. 
Some were very certain that only one individual had the right to ascend, and that was Jesus Christ. In fact, Catholic doctrine has it that the Mother Mary did not ascend, but her miraculous transition is called the Assumption. And that assumption of her into heaven is considered to be not like the ascension, for if it were, it would make her equal to Jesus Christ and therefore somehow detract from the majesty of the Savior. Well, if any of you have ever taught anyone anything, you have known the joy of the moment when your pupil was able to execute that which you taught to perfection. Whether you taught a little child how to bake a cake or you enabled someone else to become proficient in something that you could do, you felt that a part of yourself were fulfilled because you could transfer that which you were. It is so with the ascended masters. Each time a soul ascends into his causal body, the ascended master, Jesus Christ, is glorified, is magnified, his very person is multiplied. In fact, he increases himself by the law of transcendence. Some who are involved in a sentimental religion do not like to think about the fact that the ascended master, Jesus Christ, is today a person of infinite magnitude, multi multiplied many times over compared to what he was in the hour of his ascension. Do people think that for 2,000 years an ascended master has done nothing? We understand that the ascension is truly the moment when the soul is born to eternal life. Unlimited potential and possibility because it is the moment of integration of the soul with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Mother. Jesus Christ demonstrated to us that integration while he was on earth. He is considered by the Great White Brotherhood to be the greatest example of the path of the Ascension, to have been recorded in all of the history that is known, all recorded history. The position held by Jesus Christ within the Great White Brotherhood is held by none other. And there is not a cosmic being or Elohim or archangel does, that does not bow before the name of Jesus when it is spoken. But just because this is true does not mean that praise and honor should not be given to St. Germain or to El Moria or to others who have walked the path. And so the ascended masters, key among them, Jesus Christ, do not apologize for the teaching that every man can realize Christhood. When Jesus proclaimed in the final hours of his mission that those who believed on him did not believe on him but the one who had sent him and those who heard his word did not hear his word but the father which spoke through him when he said that it is written that he cried and he said that word cried stands out to me because i feel in it the intensity of his heart knowing how people are so prone to idolatry. The thing he feared most is that, that people would worship him and not emulate him, would so remove him, so exalt him, so make a god of him that they would automatically conclude that their sin or supposed sin or their sense of sin would make them something apart, something not capable of doing what he did. And therefore, everything that Jesus did becomes totally natural because he is a God. Why, of course, Jesus could do it because he is God. But we poor mortals, we poor sinners, we are not in that category. We are subject to the flesh. We are subject to original sin. We're subject to all of these conditions of consciousness. And so we see that that is the overlay of condemnation that somehow says, why I'm not as good as Jesus, and therefore I cannot walk in his footsteps. That is idolatry. It is the worship of the flesh and blood master. Now many of you may know what I am saying. 
You may be wholly convinced of what I am saying, but the majority of the world is not. And herein lies our concern, that people today have believed the lie that he came to be the exception instead of the rule. And because of that, the path of the ascension and the path of sainthood is not the central path of Christianity or Judaism or the Muslim faith. And even in Hinduism, the concepts of many, many more existences and lifetimes and balancing of karma and existence seems to be such a long road approaching infinity into the future. It's a long, dusty road. There are no longer any urgencies. There are no longer any needs to challenge what is facing us. There is no longer the sense that hour by hour and day by day things are happening of supreme importance. It's the sense that you cannot change maya or the astral condition and therefore you can retreat into the mountain and meditate and someday in the next 100,000 years you may attain soul liberation and in the meantime all sorts of perversion of the original path of Hinduism in the misuse of the sacred fire, immorality, even the use of drugs, the squandering of the life force in all sorts of sexual experimentations. I have more people coming to me from the Eastern gurus speaking of these sexual experimentations that are taught as part of the path. Well, the sexual energy is the force of light and of the mother flame. It is locked in the base of the spine chakra. It is unlocked and spent in the sexual experience. Therefore, when people are taught that for the survival, the biological or psychological survival of the individual, the sexual energy must be continually spent, they follow a path that is really not compatible with the ascension because it is a crystal cup of light. It is an elixir. Either you drink that light and live forevermore, or you squander it daily. It is a choice. It is a natural resource. Americans are waking up to the fact that resources can come to a shortage, that the earth has so much oil, the earth has so much energy. In fact, there is a, an abundance of energy, but it is being hoarded or not properly extracted for our use. It is being manipulated for the sake of manipulating the people and all of a sudden there is no gas in the gas tank. Well, that is a sudden realization to a people who have never known want for water or energy or light. We suddenly come to the realization that the energy that God gives to us materially and spiritually must be wisely used. The path of the ascension is not a path of denial. It is not a path of suppression. It is not a path of no, no, no. And if you do, you might go to hell. It is a path of great wisdom and great joy. It is the path of understanding of the raising up of the mother light in joy, abundantly, joyously. And as the light rises within the temple, it reunites in each of the seven chakras of being with the alpha and the omega potential. The descent of light from your I am presence is the light of the Father. It descends. That which descends must ascend. But the Father light does not ascend unless and until it is united with the mother light. So the mother light sealed in the base of the spine is the energy that is capable of creating a cosmos, of bringing forth life. It is also the energy that is capable of carrying the soul to the holy place, the holy of holies in the secret chamber of the heart and ultimately in the crown chakra. The use of the life force is strictly a matter of human habit. We have long, long centuries of the human habit pattern of the descent of energy. When the energy descends from the I am presence, unless it is released from the heart in love and service 
and each day given back to life that life may give again. Unless that process of the givingness of self is going on, the energy builds up. It builds up in the chakras, and unless there is a flow and an interaction with God and with every part of God in the earth, there is going to be a stopping or a stoppage of energy, that energy that collects in the lower chakras and does not flow. It collects there many times because of heavy diets. Diet itself will stop the flow of energy in the lower chakras. It is stopped there because of human habit patterns of negativity, discord, inharmony of every kind, especially in the feelings, locks the energies in the lower chakras. When people do not know how to meditate simply, to close their eyes, go into the heart, salute the living Christ, rise with that Christ into the upper chakras, they have no surcease from the endless round of the energy in the lower chakras that is in a constant state of interplay. When you look at people's lives, how they are lived, it is no wonder that they have psychological problems, sexual problems, family problems, overeating problems, physical health problems. All of these have to do with not understanding how to use this ascension flame, how to raise it up and thus begin the flow of all energy back to God. Energy that rises and ascends when it passes through the heart chakra, when you use the violet flame, is transmuted. Energy which is purified becomes energy stored in the chakras and in the aura and finally in the causal body. Energy misqualified collects and creates the buildup of energy which has its outbursts in crime, in anger, in frustration, and ultimately in sexual uses that become more than the natural or normal sexual uses. They become either perversions or an excessive obsession with sexual fantasy. We have today so much sexual symbol in our advertising, in pornography, in regular movies that are playing. We have a tremendous upsurge of homosexuality and we see that all of this is the rising of the mother flame from Lemuria. And when that rising of the mother flame takes place, it is the white light in every single person upon the planetary body that is activated. And when it is activated, it begins to outpicture the old stream beds and the old patterns. We have a long history upon this planetary body, through dark ages, through civilization. And therefore, in your own aura and etheric body, there are the records of descent of energy. And so we see that the attempts to resolve the buildup of energy in the lower chakras comes out in rock music, in disco, in rhythm. There is such an intense buildup of misqualified energy that has descended and the beginning of the raising up of that mother light that people's bodies begin to gyrate to a beat that lowers their energy lower and lower. It is a means of attempting to throw off that which is not being resolved through meditation, through integration, through the identity, realizing the point of the I am presence. Now the various activities which people engage in all the way from human gossip and the use of the tongue in human gossip is a virulent force of the misuse of sexual energy. It is interesting to note that many people who gossip enjoy gossiping about other people's sexual lives, they themselves thinking that they are free from these unnecessary habits. But in fact, their sexual expressions are through an unbridled tongue and the gossip becomes just as offensive and discordant to the environment as the pollution from other chakras. And so those who are self-righteous and pride and proud and will tell you all of their virtues may have just as much bottled up energy and just as much absence of the resolution of that light. Nevertheless, I cannot tell you an untruth. I must tell you that your ascension is directly linked to the conservation of energy within your chakras. 
to the transmutation of energy misqualified and to the taking dominion of all of the centers beginning with the heart which is the real central sun of your being the heart becomes a magnet and it will magnetize the light of the mother flame gently rhythmically up into the higher centers the transcendence therefore of the uses of energy is natural and it is not something that is forced it is not forced upon you by the law by the ascended masters but it comes to you naturally not because of suppression but because of replacement you begin to replace the habits of the misuse of energy with the giving of decrees such as those you have been giving this morning the simple affirmation of the resurrection flame begins a spiral so intense as to to find this energy rising and scintillating through your form the rising spiral of the resurrection flame that is anchored in the heart of the great pyramid itself is the means for the overcoming in and of itself the flame and the dynamic decree takes the place of the descending energy I have not set up rules and regulations nor have the ascended masters they have set a teaching and they have presented love love in its highest essence they have presented a teaching that gives you a motivation whereby in purity and comfort and compassion you can find yourself day by day enjoying the light enjoying the unity and the wholeness of that light so this path is a gradual path for you to wean yourself from very simple habits habits of diet perhaps habits of smoking all sorts of things that you know in yourself are not really the ultimate desire so you take them one by one you work diligently you pray fervently you give the appropriate decrees calls for the removal of entities that reinforce the misuse of energy but the one thing you do not do is condemn yourself self-condemnation is simply the tool of the antichrist and your own carnal mind now not to condemn yourself does not mean that you let yourself off without the necessary understanding that sin is a reality until it is forsaken and that repentance is a very important part of the path to repent from those ways that are not lawful and not in keeping with the teachings of God to sincerely in your heart ask for intercession ask for the help of the angels and Jesus Christ and Saint Germain and Archangel Michael not to condemn yourself for having a foul mouth or a foul temper doesn't mean that you simply allow it to continue to happen you strive and you wrestle with those demons but you do not get into a spiral of self-condemnation that says well I'm a miserable sinner I haven't balanced enough karma to come to grips with this I'm not Jesus Christ and therefore life will just have to take me the way I am this is the way I am take me or leave me I've, he I've heard people make this ultimatum to God to the ascended masters and to me and of course that is not the way of the path the path is a path of acceptable striving a striving that you can contain and not go off the deep end the ascended masters are not fanatics they don't like fanatical fasting or fanatical decreeing or fanatical anything they want you to be examples of a higher way of an abundant life that you can live in and among your neighbors and your profession on your job and show that life lived for the goal of reunion with God can be viable that people pursuing this path are indeed normal people helpful people understanding people that have families and raise children and perhaps have problems with those children just as everyone else has problems with children that they can become active and get involved in community service that they are not aloof and by all means they are not in a state of condemnation of other people who perhaps are living very good and beautiful lives but do not happen to be on the path of the ascension 
Therefore, self-righteousness and fanaticism can be the very tools of Antichrist to discredit the entire path of the brotherhood. I would like you to know that I see people who have taken up the teachings of the Ascended Masters who are far more fanatical and zealous than I am. It's a strange occurrence. It is as if they felt that somehow in the letter of the law, as Paul warned against, going back to the rituals of Judaism, that is, fulfilling the letter of the law without the Spirit, they could somehow buy their way into the kingdom of heaven. Once I was in a restaurant and I was next to a table where there were two Christians seated and they were discussing the theological question that if they sinned and then they asked for forgiveness, that God would have to take them into heaven. And it is though, as though they were looking at the law as legalists, as scribes, and saying, well, the law says this, this, and this, and if I do this, 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 and this, then God will have to take me into heaven. And I could see that they were operating under the rules of Christianity by fear and not by love. They had not really overcome those things that they refrained from. And yet it was good that, re that they refrained from them, but it was not good that they were not overcoming their fear. So I have seen people, and I have been shown the record, of various priests and nuns in Christianity or Buddhism who have served in their monasteries in various lifetimes, and they have fulfilled the whole letter of the law. And when they have come to the conclusion of that incarnation and they have gone to the karmic board, they have not been given the initiation of the crucifixion or the resurrection or the ascension because they didn't have the spirit of love. Love was the gaping hole in their entire experience. They sought to buy their way by perfect performance but within them was the seething resentment and the sense of injustice, the sense of martyrdom. This is why the Ascended Masters, Jesus and Kathumi, come with the path of the world teachers. They come to teach us something about the psychology of the self. Why does the self want association with the Ascended Masters? Has it been rejected by the world and therefore it needs to have some kind of an imaginary association with imaginary beings of light who will now flatter that individual and flatter his psyche? Or is it because of the basic love for every part of life and the realization that these saints have given their lives and because they have given them, we live? and that these ascended masters are not aloof. They're in the ghettos. They're in the places where people have the greatest want and the greatest need. And there they look for an instrument to minister to life. The ascended masters are the bodhisattvas, tarrying with this earth until every one of us discovers the key to the ascension. Psychology and the understanding of the motive of the heart. The heart has motives, but the subconscious desire body also has motives. Freud well outlined the desires of the id and the energies of the libido and how these desires really were the foundation of what is outpictured on the surface. This may be true, but once you know it, it does not have to continue to be true. The four horsemen of the apocalypse about which Sanat Kumara is lecturing in his current Pearls of Wisdom are symbolical of your four lower bodies. They are the vehicles of your consciousness. You, you, your soul within your Christ self is intended to be the driver the single rider on all four horses. Unfortunately, the ego fragments itself into four persons and comes riding on the four horses and completely dominates the scene. And the soul has no say about what will happen 
or its future. The unsealing of the seven sealed book by Samat Kumara opens the way for us to realize that until the Christ person within us is crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords and sits upon the throne, these four horsemen have a heyday and the ego itself, that carnal mind, that impure desire and the impure motive of the heart is given complete freedom to run rampant, to bring hell and death and famine and pestilence and all manner of disturbance within this temple. So the desire body is a body that we ride and the soul takes dominion and the soul becomes aware of impure desire and the soul meditates upon God and discovers what is God's desire in the universe. God's desiring to be himself in all of us is the desire for life to be lived abundantly, joyously, lovingly. When we meditate upon the desire of God, we realize that there is no conflict between our soul and the spirit of God. That impure desire leads to death and self-annihilation. We don't really want it. It is the not-self, the unreal self. And so we begin the path of invoking the violet flame into the impure desire to transmute its momentum, the cause, effect, record, and memory of all previous lifetimes. And we invoke the desire of God to come into this temple and transform us. And do you know what you find, what I have found? That the desire of God is so all-consuming that moment by moment and breath by breath, you have no other desire than to be in God, to do his will, to outpicture his desire. There is no other desire left within you but to know him. There is nothing that God has ever taken from me or deprived me of to give me the victory of my ascension. I am no martyr. I am not a deprived person. I enjoy the fullness of life. The life that I enjoy is the fullness of God's love. And therefore, what would seem to some as temptation is not temptation because it is of no interest, because God has filled me with his life. He has filled me with his Holy Spirit, all of my needs, all that I could possibly ever want is fulfilled by that Holy Spirit. And so, the message that I bring you is that the path of the ascension is not a path of suffering. It is only a path of suffering to those who are the prisoners of the carnal mind, who are so convinced that they need all of those activities of the carnal mind, that to give them up, the very thought of giving up those activities is death itself. You've all heard the stories of people in hospitals dying of lung cancer who are smoking away even when they've had operations. They would rather die than stop smoking. I hear it very often from relatives of people on the path for whom I pray making the transition. But is that their true desire? No, it is not. That is the possessing demon, that temple of that individual who is bound by the nicotine and cigarette habit is invaded by the nicotine entity, virulent and vicious to the very death of the individual. It has a worm manifestation. It has a demon manifestation. It enters the temple. It takes it over. It creates the insatiable desire for cigarettes until a person is a habitual chain smoker. It destroys the body. It eats the body. And what does it get? The net gain it gets is all of the light stored in the cells of the temple. And therefore, it perpetuates its existence and goes forth to come upon other houses, other temples. A person who says, I would rather die than not have a cigarette is not expressing his free will. He is not expressing his free will. He is enslaved by possessing demons. And the message that I bring to you this morning comes from Sanat Kumara, as you will read it in the coming Pearls of Wisdom. 
He brings to you the message of the Great Commission to go forth into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He brings us the understanding that to preach is to have the power to reach the soul that is in a state of demon possession. You begin with yourself. We begin with one another. And when God is raised up within us and when the Holy Spirit is in us, then when we speak, the power of the word goes forth. It goes forth from the heart of your I am presence to your Christ self. And what does it contact in that poor soul that is enslaved to a possessing demon? It first contacts that soul's real identity who is the person of the Christ. This is why your Christian leaders have no power to exercise the demons in church and state, why all of America is rampant with these demons that possess our children. Whether alcohol or nicotine, sugar, sugar as an entity is just as much addicting and addictive and destructive as drugs and rock and the death beat itself. We have a nation that is in a state of demon possession. And where are the religious leaders who can go forth and exorcise them in his name? O oh, ye of little faith, if they have the ultimate word, let them prove the word by their works. The ascended masters, chilas, are proving their word by their works. And Jesus Christ has given to them the knowledge of the Elohim, Astraea. The call to, a, a, to mighty Astraea, to one of the seven Elohim, the seven spirits of God listed in the Bible, brings down upon us the action of the light of a circle and sword of blue flame for the binding of demons. I have seen the calls of the students singly and in unison bind entire hordes and rampaging demons of murder, of destruction, of war, of riot. I have seen all kinds of conditions in our cities and in our nation stopped by the dynamic decrees. The dynamic decrees work, and you must begin with yourself, because unless you are free from any form of mental suggestion that comes from discarnate entities or demons, you do not have the full faculties of your free will. Sanat Kumara says that in order to have the power to preach, the Holy Spirit must come into you. And if you desire that spirit, you must be begin the exercise of the word. You must begin to witness. This is why Jesus taught his disciples to witness unto him and his person. When you speak of Jesus Christ or El Moria or Saint Germain, their very name spoken through you draws their presence into you. When you witness to their reality and the reality of Almighty God in your life, you are confirming that presence where you stand. And so daily the word is confirmed, the person of the word and the power of the word. So in order to get the power to preach, you have to begin to preach. That's the message of the world teachers. If you're going to get the Holy Spirit into your temple to transform lesser desire into greater desire and to know the joy that is my daily cup that I speak to you of, you have to start the ball rolling. You have to thread the needle. You have to pull that thread of consciousness through the eye of God. You've got to begin. It just doesn't happen. As one very interesting religious teacher told me many years ago when I was making my decision to be or not to be a Chila of El Moria, to leave everything and to follow the path of my ascension. And he said to me, why, the ascension is something that just happens at the end of your life if you lead a good life. And I thought, life should be so simple. And I looked at him and I knew that I had outgrown that teacher. And I knew that I must go on. To walk alone is better than to walk with a false teacher who is limiting your expression. 
Better walk with your mighty I am presence. Walk the streets and pace the floor and talk to God and say, God, cleanse me and purge me, raise me up. I want to do your work, but my life is not yet in a condition where I can serve you because I myself am still bound. When you have that point of realization, you know that you have joined with the discontented ones, those who are dissatisfied, and dissatisfied, dissatisfaction itself is the only condition of consciousness calculated to make an avatar. If you are content with your slavery and refuse to see that you are enslaved, then you will be enslaved. So were the Israelites in Egypt. And this is what Sanat Kumara teaches us. When you begin to preach the word and that fire is hurled forth from you, you contact the living Christ in your hearers. And it is that person of the Christ, the Christ self, the blessed mediator of that one who reaches down and lets a light ray descend and quicken that soul. Have you ever been asleep and not wanted to be awakened? You've only slept a few hours, you got home late. You want to sleep in and somebody comes along and shakes you. And you get very annoyed. You find yourself feisty and nasty and saying, don't wake me up. Well, that's the way it is with the soul. It is comfortably asleep. It knows it is asleep. And yet it wants to be asleep. It wants to sleep on and on like someone that is sleeping off drugs or alcohol. They want to sleep and sleep. And when they awaken, they start the round again. So they'll go back to sleep. They don't want to face life. Sanat Kumara says that when you begin to preach, you arouse anger on two fronts. The anger of those demons that are possessing and inhabiting the temple of the one you desire to rescue. And you also contact the resistance of the soul to be awakened. Go away, leave me alone. Don't tell me all of this truth. I can't stand to hear it because if I hear it, I'll have to do something about it. Let me sleep on. Sleeping that sleep of death, this is where we find the self-induced hypnosis of our people. Why are people glued to the TV set? It is because they really want to be hypnotized. Because no one has shown them another reason for living, another way of living, a joyous way of living. And all the do's and don'ts of religion or society are just too painful. If you have the courage to listen to the truth, even a small amount of the truth, you can hear the door creaking open and the soul will come forth from its tomb and begin to live. And day by day you have the opportunity for more and more self-mastery. And you realize that every point of self-dominion is such a joy why you say praise the Lord. In the name of the Ascended Master, Jesus Christ and Saint Germain, I have lived this day to prove that the law works, that when I give a dynamic decree, light descends and my life changes and things start happening for the better and I start finding out my divine plan. To experiment with a law that is precise, a law that is mathematics, that is yours for the taking, and then to watch it work. It's like the delight of a child who takes his first step because you've done it yourself. You, a soul, have risen up. You have contacted your personal Christ self, your I am presence, and you realize that in actuality there is a path back home that doesn't come by superstition or witchcraft or psychic formulas or all kinds of necromancy. Why do you realize that in this hemisphere, in North and South and Central America, millions of people today are practicing witchcraft or superstition mixed up with their Christian religion, conjuring up psychic entities, spiritualism, charting their lives on worldly astrology? Do you realize how many devious pathways there are when the one supreme path of the mighty I Am Presence is there? 
and can be walked step by step. I would like you to know that I have been walking this path a long time, that I am no different from any one of you. I happen to remember my past lives. I do not con fear to confront them. When I see an Akashic record that tells me that I have sinned or done something that was not the better part of wisdom in the past, I thank God for the opportunity today to do ten or a hundred things to undo that and make it right. I can face the fact that I've made mistakes. I can face the fact that the self I was yesterday is not the self I want to be today or tomorrow. I don't have to condemn myself. I can say, thank you, God, for giving me the opportunity to experiment in free will with consciousness and life and with my four lower bodies. I've made terrible mistakes. I am very sorry, and I am here to atone for them. Let me go to work and do some things right and show that by your law, people can rise up. You know, there are those who always want to quote the words of Paul who said, we've all sinned and come short of the mark. We've all sinned. Well, that may be true. But isn't there ever a day when someone can stop sinning and say, I'm going to live the life of righteousness? When does it end? When does the condemnation end? Possessing demons will continue to tell you that sin goes on and on in the suffering of sin. But the individual who truly is saved and knows God is no longer a sinner. And he does not fear his sin because he knows that it is swallowed up and transmuted by the Holy Spirit when he will stand, face, and conquer. Have the courage to be a saint. Have the courage to say, I am walking the path of sainthood, and God has placed his spark within me, and by his grace I'm capable of walking that path, and it is my inheritance. I tell you this because I have seen the fruits of following the path in my own life. I have been through the testings of Luxor. I have been with Serapis in the king's chamber. I have passed through the trials of the long dark night. I have seen the labyrinth. I have been sent into hell to preach to the rebellious spirits. I've seen the devil face to face. And what have I learned? I've learned that only God is power, only God is real. And the moment you say his name, all that is unlike him trembles and fears before your footstep. I have learned that there is no dragon or beast that can confront a single soul when that soul is wedded to God. I have seen conditions of power and the attempt to destroy my life or the lives of other people entirely swallowed up by the name of God, by the person of Archangel Michael. I have seen the threats of the ultimate fear of death. I have looked at death face to face, and I have seen the living proof of Jesus Christ that death is not real, that there is no death, that the coming and the going within this temple and other temples is provided by God, and he has many mansions, celestial and terrestrial. When you cease to fear death, you work backwards because all other fears are lesser. Mark used to tell me, if you fear what will happen, contemplate the ultimate threat. The ultimate threat is always death. If that's not so bad, then nothing else will bother you. It really works. I saw Mark Prophet go through the experience of what appeared to be physical death. I saw him. I took his hand. I realized I would not see him again in this octave in a physical form. Something inside of me died, and something inside of me 
was born. I saw the temple, but I saw the soul. I saw the soul rise into the ascension, and I whispered to him, you've won, you've made it, you're the victor. And that is what he wanted to know that I learned from that experience. No, I didn't descend into the idolatry that because the flesh and blood were no longer functioning, that somehow he was not there. That would have been a worship of his physical person. But I had a very human prayer in my heart when I took his hand, and I said, Dear God, I cannot believe that somewhere in this universe I will not take that hand again. That is something you say when you are required to place that loved one upon the funeral pyre in the cremation chamber. We become attached to the body, but the body is mother, the body is renewed, and as Paul said, there are celestial bodies. And that ascended master light body of Mark Prophet is here and now where I am. It is superimposed where I am and we are one. And therefore that which dies in oneself is the one-on-one -on -one human relationship. And that which is born is the awareness of androgynous being that you and your twin flame here and now occupy the same time and space and that you are one. The human mind from time to time is tempted to believe in separation. That's simply the law of time and space. But I have a retreat in my heart where I go when I am tempted with that temptation. And in that secret chamber of the heart, I renew again my awareness of the total cosmos. It is not far from me. It is not far. But so long as we live in this octave, we will deal with those situations. And when you can deal with them fearlessly, you know you are on the path of the ascension. And I want to tell you that every one of you can make it. I am not so old as years go in this embodiment. It didn't take me all of my lifetime to come to this realization. Very early in my life, I had that awareness of God consciousness. But that was from other incarnations and other lifetimes. But you have your momentum too. Did you ever consider that while you are bound by this or that human habit, you are not opening the great floodgates to the descent of your own God consciousness that locked in your causal body right now is attainment, that on other battlefields in other lifetimes you have won victories over yourself, and that right now you don't have the full momentum of that discipline in your outer four lower bodies because you haven't made room for it. Kick out those unnecessary things. You know, I came to San Francisco, and I came the messenger of Serapis, I came in his consciousness and in his mantle. And one of the first students I met had two requests to make of me. And these requests were quite mundane and quite concerned with mundane life. And I thought to myself, just think if he could have understood what really happened, if he could have really seen Serapis standing where I stood. If you had the opportunity to speak with Serapis Bay, what favor would you ask him? Would you treat him as a genie and say, oh, Serapis, give me human happiness, solve my financial problems, make all things comfortable for me? I hope you would say, Serapis Bay, come into my temple and show me why I don't have more God consciousness. Reveal to me how I can transmute by the sacred fire what is standing in the way of my mastery. Serapis Bay, initiate me 
in the very first steps of Luxor. I hope that would be on your mind. But sadly, of course, Serapis comes, looking like any one of us, and any one of us happens to be me. And so, little old me gets asked these mundane questions, can I do this or can I do that? You know, there came a time in my life when I was determined that nothing would stand in my way. And I demanded those initiations, and I received them. And they were like the flood of arrows darkening the sky at Thermopylae. But the Christ is standing there, and God really never gives us more than we can take. But sometimes we have to catch up. Sometimes we've allowed ourselves to sleep, We've indulged ourselves for a long time. It's like collecting your dirty laundry. It piles up and all of a sudden one day you have an extraordinary burden. And then you demand to be free and it all comes out. And then someone asks, why am I having so many problems? I don't understand why when I just came back from the retreat of the world teachers that suddenly I have such burdens. Well, you came to the retreat of the world teachers to learn how to challenge those burdens. Did you think you would go away from the retreat and life would be a bed of roses? Why, you have to have something to sharpen your sword on. How will you know what the muscle of the heart can do if you don't have a challenge of that burning in your heart? A burning in the heart is something that is very natural to the saints. Some people panic, even if they're 22, and they say, oh, I have this terrible heart condition. No, your heart is becoming a fiery furnace of the ruby ray. The intensity of the white light is burning, and it's burning as a fiery vortex for transmutation. And God is using you to clean up the earth. He needs his fiery furnaces all over the place. Remember when they stopped letting you burn your garbage and your leaves? They won't even let the fiery salamanders come and clean up the garbage of the planet because it might pollute the air, but they didn't stop the trucks and the buses and the planes. They didn't stop the chemical factories from polluting the air, but you can't burn your leaves in your backyard anymore. Well, we need to burn physically, and we need to burn spiritually, and it's a burning and a shining light that came with John the Baptist and Jesus Christ who said, I am come to send fire on the earth. And that fire begins as a fire in your heart. And when you first come into the dictations of the ascended masters, sometimes you get very hot because of the alchemy of transmutation. And after a while, you feel very cool. And you find that the sensation of fire is coolness. If you went to the sun of our system today, would you be hot or cold? Depends on your vibration. Whether you can pass through the sun and feel heat or feel coolness depends the level of your consciousness, depends how much misqualified energy is within you. The burning in the heart is God loving life through you. God loves life so much, and especially God loves those whom you think are your enemies. And when those enemies are gossiping or maligning or persecuting, as Jesus promised they would, to those on the path, what happens to your heart? It gets on fire. And the burning process is the flame. And the flame is consuming that anger and that hatred because if it didn't, the anger itself might very well remove you from the screen of life. But God protects you. He lights a light in your heart. And if you experience a little pain, it's because you haven't put enough into the fire. You need some more kindling wood. You need some more to burn to make it hotter. In other words, you need to give some more violet flame decrees. Increase the fire, the burning will increase, the consuming will increase, and you'll discover that your fiery vortex has grown. You're becoming a great central sun, and you're moving on that path that Sana Kumara is talking about in these pearls of wisdom.